Today, the Twitter feed from NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, made for some pretty good reading. He writes, uh, Iraq flew in from Amman. They're using bigger planes now and no spiral corkscrew landing. A good sign. This next one said, uh, Iraq just saw a parking lot on a U.S. base. I'd seen it before filled with American Humvees. Now it's full of SUVs of security companies. In just a moment, we'll be talking with reporter Michael Hastings, who is on his way to Iraq as well to cover this weekend's elections there. Michael's been in and out of Iraq a lot recently, including hanging out with Ahmed Shalabi. Beyond the headlines about the election, though, the big news about Iraq today and about life during wartime is that the contractor KBR, which used to be part of Halliburton, just got themselves a new U.S. government contract for work in Iraq, a contract that could be worth as much as $2.8 billion. You'll recall that KBR also had the contract to do the electrical work on living quarters for U.S. troops in Iraq. 24-year-old Green Beret Staff Sergeant Ryan Maseth was killed by electrocution while taking a shower in living quarters maintained by KBR. 17 other deaths of U.S. service personnel by electrocution were investigated concerning that KBR contract in Iraq. In fact, Sergeant Maseth's hometown news outlets just Thursday reported that KBR, the company tied the, to that, that the company tied to his electrocution death, KBR, would not be getting a $25 million bonus payment from the government. But then get this, the very next day on Friday, forget that little piddling $25 million penalty, the very next day, KBR was told they're getting a brand new $2.8 billion deal. I love the smell of accountability in the morning. Joining us now is Michael Hastings. He's covering the elections this weekend in Iraq for GQ. He's been in and out of Iraq a lot recently and over the last few years. His book, I Lost My Love in Baghdad, is just now out in paperback. Michael, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Um, as you're heading back to Iraq, to are you heading back tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Do you feel like these elections are the first time that Iraq has been back on the radar screen for a while now? Well, besides the Hurt Locker, basically. But, yeah. I, but, but I, think, I think it's significant now that the, the debate about Iraq has moved from a policy debate to how we're going to remember Iraq and what narrative and legacy the United States leaves behind when they leave. Yeah. Um, I, I think I even these elections are almost just a blip uh, compared to the news in Afghanistan. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would definitely say that Iraq has fallen off the radar, and there's a collective desire that I think we have as a country to put it behind us. When, when you are in Iraq these days, what is, what's the role, what's the function that you can perceive of the 110,000 U.S. troops who are still there? They're very bored. Mm. Uh, they're sitting around on bases complaining about how bored they are for the most part. They'll probably be busy uh, these next couple of uh, days, obviously, as they help the Iraqis prepare for the election. But essentially, they're waiting to go home as well. In terms of the security challenges that still plague Iraq, not just the political challenges, but literally the big bombings that keep happening, U.S. troops are not playing a role in security in terms of preventing those things from happening. I, exactly. I, I mean, th this is the issue right now with security. Why has Iraq fallen out of the headlines? Because Americans aren't getting killed. Why aren't Americans getting killed? They're not the targets anymore. Yeah. Uh, and they're also staying on their bases quite a bit. So the security challenges are, are all the attacks have been aimed at the Iraqi government, and these are significant attacks, massive car bombings, Oklahoma City-style bombings every couple of months in the capital city. Uh, there's been a, a, a rash of political assassinations, detentions, uh, politically motivated detentions. Uh, kidnappings have increased recently as well. Members of the Independent Election Committee have been kidnapped uh, and, and targeted for assassination as well. One of the things that's happened that has made, the, at least inside the, inside the newspaper headlines right. here, uh, is that a number of candidates, hundreds, dozens, hundreds of candidates, hundreds. Uh, suddenly disqualified from running in these elections this month. What happened there? Who done it? Uh, well, the force behind the scenes there was Ahmed Chalabi, the wow. man who, uh, once the CIA Pentagon favorite, who uh, sold the weapons of mass destruction information or passed off the weapons of destruction of uh, information, uh, the fake information. And essentially, uh, the Americans are saying Chalabi, uh, under orders from Iran, is trying to target secular candidates and Sunni candidates. And this is the most troubling sign for the future of Iraqi democracy, because American officials will say, look, yeah, maybe the war was a mistake, but Iraq is on this path towards a democratic future. I would be highly skeptical of that argument. Uh, what we're seeing now is the Shiite-dominated Islamist government in Baghdad consolidate its power. And they're doing this by any means necessary. And one of the ways they're doing this is to legally take out their political opponents. You wrote uh, at True Slant recently, 
Iraq will have very little resemblance to any of the imagined U.S. foreign policy goals that Iraqis and Americans were asked to sacrifice their lives for. Is that, is that why? Because we're not, there's, there's, there's no Western recognizable democracy taking shape here? I, I think, you know, you could point to signs that there are some uh, recognizable sort of uh, trappings of democracy. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think, I, I think what we're going to see this weekend and the argument I'm making is that this could be Iraq's last election. Essentially sort of the final democratic gasp Iraq has, the final purple-fingered farewell uh, salute before falling back into its familiar pattern of authoritarianism. Here's, here's a little anecdote. I'm sitting in the uh, election commission building speaking to an election official, an Iraqi election official. And this official tells me that if Saddam Hussein was on the ballot today, I would vote for Saddam Hussein. Wow. Then she went on to say 99% of the people in this office would vote for Saddam Hussein. And that, I think, gives a picture of... of what sort of sentiment that Iraqis have about the future of their country. They, they, would, they would actually want a dictator back. Michael Hastings, contributor to GQ magazine, the author of I Lost My Love in Baghdad, a modern war story, which again is just out in paperback and which I personally highly recommend. Michael, thank you. Thanks for having Good me. luck in Baghdad. Thank you. Coming up on Countdown, Congressman Anthony Weiner on The Way Forward on Health Reform and next on this show, Why Dogs Bark at the Law and Order theme music. A very special update. Stay tuned.